your burdens, and I want to emphasize your burdens. Our father corrects his children when they're part of the family. If you're not part of the family, he's just going to let you slide along. Whatever you want to do, hey, it's all right with him. Well, it's not all right with him, but you're the one. He lets everybody choose their own um, uh, life, lifestyle, and what happens to them in the eternity. He's a good father. He's not going to interfere with your life unless you ask him to. So naturally, your burdens become a very important thing. In Hebrews chapter 11, and you can open your Bibles to, we're going to pick up in chapter 12. But in chapter 11, Paul goes through quite a line of, I mean, great people. He starts with um, Enoch, comes to Abraham, Joseph, Jacob, uh, Moses, did I say? And uh, on down, I mean people that have really worked for the Lord. And do you know something? In that 12th chapter, he includes you in that uh, group of witnesses. Witnesses for what? Witnesses for God. The word witness, as you're going to see it utilized in chapter 12, verse 1, means not only to witness for Christ, but to be a legal, legal witness at a trial. And guess whose trial it's looking forward to? Possibly yours, before the false Messiah. So that's why the legal connotation to the word witness. After all, all those names for mentioned in chapter 11, which is known as the faith chapter. How's your faith doing? Okay? And... He brings it right down to our doorstep. And he tells us how to shape up, prepare, or basically to ship out, whichever you choose. Okay? Uh, that's an old military term, ship out. That means get out of the camp. All right? So, but the choice is always yours. Why? He loves you. That way, on judgment day, when he sends some to hell, they haven't got a leg to stand on. They've named it for themselves, chose it for themselves, reacted on it for themselves, and it's their baby. Okay? So you're either family of God or you've chosen something different. That's up to you. Totally, completely up to you, and that's as it should be. This is one reason in this church you're never going to get a letter, where were you Wednesday when we had Bible study, if we were to have it. Or, where were you last week? We missed you because of your offering. That's, <laughs> that's why they usually send those things, you know, anyway. I'm just being honest, okay? But it's none of my business where you were Wednesday. It's none of anybody else's business where you were Sunday or Saturday or whatever day of the week. You're serving God and you're going to answer for it. You may not be serving God, you're going to answer for that. So, that's up to you. It's your, it's your baby, and treat it nice, okay? Keep it well diapered and favored, because it could be, mean a great deal to you before this life is over with. Okay, then that bringing us, letting us know what kind of group he's, he's talking about here with um, Enoch, who was one of the first preachers, Noah being one of the second, and um, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, um, Joseph, and all down through. Even he mentions little old Rahab in verse 31 of that chapter 11, bringing female witnesses into the group. So we pick it up with chapter 12 as he brings it to your doorstep. Let's analyze it. Wherefore, or because of all this, this word in the Greek is emphatic, okay? I mean, it's bringing it right to your doorstep. Because of this, wherefore, seeing we, that's you, I, and Paul being the writer, all those that are in the family, also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. That means you're in the same family as those four mentioned in faith. Let us, now that's kind of a suggestion. Let us what? It's very important because it put let us, not let somebody else, let us lay aside every weight. 
and what else? And the sin which doth so easily beset us. Well, what does that mean? Sin that messes you up big time. Puts you on some kind of ego trip. Making you think you're different from anybody else. Possibly. Something of that nature. And let us run with patience. That means endurance. Don't give up the first quarter. Okay? Have a little strength and discipline about yourself whereby you can stay focused on yourself. No, God's Word. All else is just simply trash by the wayside. God's Word is, will be with us forever. Patience, that means endurance, the race that is set before us. This word race is agon in the Greek, and it, it can also mean a trial. And that's what you have witnesses for at trials, is um, to um, give a testimony. To witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it be to fellow man or against the false Messiah as the Holy Spirit speaks through you. Now, it's very important. Uh, let's, I think you need to do a little homework on this word. Let us lay aside every weight. That word in the, the Greek is A-G-K-O-S. Agos. A kos. And it means um, the word arm is to bend, though you had so much weight on something, a mass that comes upon you. He said, get rid of it. Do you know what that's saying? That means your troubles are the things that come against you in this life. Get rid of it. You don't need trouble. Let somebody else have it. You're too busy. You've got to get rid of that stuff. Many of you that will say to me, how are you? How's your day today? I always say, hey, it's great. I let other people have the bad days, okay? And I, I believe that with all my heart, you know? Why? Because if some trouble comes along, I'm going to nip it in the bud and stomp it out of my way before it ever has a chance to have any growth to it. So, what's it saying? You've got to get rid of your sins. And you've got to get rid of the burdens that would bow you over where you're not fit to serve Christ. Why? You, got, you can't get your mind on God if, you, if you're bowed under with burdens. You might ask yourself, who put them there? Where did they come from? And I could ask another big question. Why do you put up with it? You don't have to. That's why he just kind of is passing by, said, cast them off. Lay them to the side. That's what the Greek word means. Get rid of it. Because you're not fit to serve God until the burdens you brought on yourself, you unload your donkey, friend. You put it off to the side, you get rid of it. And what caused the burden? Probably the following thing. Set your sins that so easily beset you. That means sidetracks you. Takes you off focus. Makes you start thinking about self instead of what it is you're supposed to be witnessing. That is to say God's word. So, the, hey, do you know something? You will either line up with those things or he won't be able to use you. You're going to be too busy with self. You're going to be too tied up with what's happening in your life that's a burden. That word weight is an interesting word. You ought to think about it. You should check it out in the Greek. That's what you're supposed to get rid of, okay? That weight that just comes in and crushes you mentally and spiritually. And some people just ride along all the time and say, oh, woe is me. Well, you should, because woe you are. Get rid of, cast aside the weight. You know, I suppose some might say, well, you don't understand, brother, my life. Let me ask you something. How, after chapter 11, when we go all the way back to Enoch and Abraham, and Moses and what those people went through. What do your little troubles amount to? 
probably you should laugh about it instead of worry about it. And how did they get rid of their problem? Faith in him. You know, he made a promise in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. He said, I'm never going to let a burden come up on you that isn't common to everybody. In other words, it happens to everyone. You should be able to handle it. He said, I'm never going to be let, allow you to be tempted over or burdened over what you can bear. And I am always, this is where faith comes in. I am always going to give you a way out. He meant it. He promised it. You can count on it. It's better than money in the bank. And, and the, why do I bring that scripture up? Well, it, it has to do with casting, getting rid of that weight. Hey, you're somebody. You're a child of God. You're special. You're, you're, you should be blessed. Why? God promises blessings. But you've got to get rid of that weight. And you've got to get rid of that sin. I wish I could say some of us were perfect. We're not. We're always going to have some sin. So I don't want to load your, overload your donkey here with uh, goody goody two shoes until the first time you fall short you just give up. We all fall short occasionally. But that, that doesn't mean you got to quit. That means you made it that far. Get up and go again. Don't worry. God will get your attention if you mess up. He's going to take you to the woodshed. That's his promise also. He gets your attention to let you know you're not very pleasing to me. Therefore, I'm going to jerk your joy. I'm going to jerk your happiness. I'm going to confuse you a while. I mean, he has a way of getting your attention when you're not pleasing to him. Okay, so it's so very important when you realize the crowd you're traveling with. All the way back to Enoch, Moses. Abraham you're part of that family and he expects you to walk in that walk and think in that discipline rather than oh Lord I'm late on my car payment again oh why you messed up again didn't you you weren't careful you bought something you shouldn't have didn't you rather than making your car payment well, it's not my fault. Yes, it is your fault. Okay? That's just the way it is, friend. The buck stops with you. You park and build up your own troubles. And you've been told by God's word, stay out of usury as much as you can. Why pay twice for something? So you bring troubles on yourself. Think about it. And what am I, why would I say that? Cast the weight off. The biggest, one of the biggest, largest weights we have in this world today is usury. That means interest when you should have been a little bit patient and paid cash. You should have made payments to yourself. Well, that would take six months. Big deal. You'll, be, you'll have it paid for a lot quicker. Buy it on time and it's two years. Plus it costs you twice as much. I don't like to pay twice for things, okay? I, I, I'm going to occasionally, as we go through this, tell you how to shed the weight, all right? Like water running off a duck's back. But you got to get with the program. You got to get with the family. He said, get rid of that stuff if you want to be a witness for him. Otherwise, hey, have a good trip. That's just the way it is. You cannot demand that anybody do something. It's their own choice, but it is your responsibility as a witness to forewarn them. Verse 2 in chapter 12. Um, looking, with having put aside all that stuff, what do you do then? You focus or you're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. Alpha and Omega. From A to Z. The beginning and the end. He's everything of our faith and the faith was the subject of chapter 11 who for the joy that was set before him that's that heavenly bliss that he saw that we would be able to enjoy in the eternity if you're worthy not worthy hey sorry we won't miss you because you'll be blotted out we won't even remember you ever existed period that's the way it is 
uh, before him endured, he endured the cross. Boy, now the, and you want troubles, you want burdens. To be nailed to a cross is quite a burden. But he joyfully did it for you, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For what purpose? What's, what's on the throne? of? That's a mercy seat. Why? Whereby he could shower you with mercy if you comply to his teachings. If you comply to his word. Verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest or if we be wearied and faint in your minds. If your little old troubles in this world beset you, compared to what he was before that day at that trial, when he had to witness and it was written he couldn't open his mouth, couldn't answer, and for you, he was perfect, we're not, but he, therefore he had to die for us to be that perfect sacrifice whereby he could sit on the mercy seat, be your lawyer, adversary, uh, your uh, representative before Almighty God. I mean, to take care of your problems when you would ask. You see... If you don't know it, if you have the faith, if you're ready to cast off a burden, the first thing you ask is his help and to give you the strength to handle it. As we discussed in the last time I taught, you don't pray that, uh, that problems go away. You pray that God will give you the strength to stomp them, to get rid of them, to get them out of your life. This is just kind of following along that line. There he sits by the hand of Almighty God that controls everything and you're worried about your troubles? When you have an advocate there, a comforter, shame. Verse 4. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. In other words, you haven't been asked yet to be crucified. And you know what? He was it one and for all times, as you, if we had covered the 10th chapter of this great book. 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto us as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. When God comes down on you, you kiss the paddle, say, Thank you, Father, I'll get my act together. Because if you're part of the family, God's going to correct you. He's going to get your attention some way. And do you know what? You think he doesn't know what you relish or what you enjoy the most to get your attention? You bet he does. Now, uh, our father is a great deal. What does a parent, usually when they're going to ground somebody, what is the first thing they take away? The thing the child enjoys most. That's going to get their attention. Well, do you think our Heavenly Father is um, not intelligent enough that that's what he's going to do to you? He's going to pull away your pretties. All right? That's the first thing he's going to take is what you enjoy most. And what is he saying? I want to get your attention. Why? You're supposed to be a witness and you're flubbing up. That means you're messing up, all right? Good old southern term. Messing up again. And Father takes us to... The, do you know what that's a sign of, though? You can rejoice because it means he still loves you. It means he cares. And he, he's saying, I need you, but I need you to listen to my word and get rid of the junk. And I don't mean maybe. I want you to be rid of it so you can think of higher things as Enoch, Abraham, uh, Noah, Moses. I'm a little out of chronology there, but be that as it may. Joseph, Jacob, and yes, Rahab. You know, they called her a harlot, though she wasn't. She was, one of, she was a shrewd businesswoman, and that usually draws a woman, especially at that time, a bad name. Anyway... Uh, you're traveling in that kind of company 
Because the witness of God's word is extremely important. It's mature. It's valuable. And he wants you to be where he needs you, not where you think you should be. All right? Um, so, therefore, God corrects us. He really does. He gets our attention. Verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. He takes him to the woodshed and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Did it say part of them? Do you know why it says every? And there's no gender in that, ladies, if you think he just means male. There's no gender in that. He says, I take everybody to the woodshed. You know why? Because everybody messes up occasionally, so don't feel lonely. He's going to correct you. Just say, thank you, Father. Help me to be better. Help me to make better decisions. Help me to handle my life a little more with a little more common sense, whereby I'm befitting to carry the name of a child of God. Verse 7. If ye endure chastising or chastening, if you take it humbly, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the Father uh, chasteneth not? He said every one of them. In other words, if he doesn't chasten you, there's something wrong maybe somewhere when you mess up. Verse 8, but if you be without chastisement, whereof are all our partakers, that means every one of them, then are you bastards and not sons. You're just not part of the family. Yeah, but, brother, you don't understand. The reason he doesn't correct me is I'm perfect. Now, when somebody comes along talking like that, you're talking about somebody that's not family. God made it very clear that he touches every one of us. He cares. But there are people that go so far, uh, he, he'll let them go. Paul even taught that with the man that practiced incest. He said, let him go to the devil and let the devil straighten him out. Let him play witchcraft and, and evil spirits. The Satan will change their mind. So God, when God loves you, he knows what is necessary. He knows what medicine it takes. Now, I'm not going to cover all of this chapter, but I'm going to take you down to the 25th verse so that you know this applies to you because it's talking about the second advent, the return of Christ. The subject is Christ. Verse 25, let's pick it up there. This is why you don't need any burdens, friend. You've got all you can do just following God. Verse 25 of the same chapter. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. That means this word, God's word. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Kind of falls in a different category. In other words, you're embracing here, refusing the Holy Spirit, which is the unpardonable sin. That's how it's that important. And it prepares you mentally to stand as that witness. 26. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. This speaks of the second advent. Where did he speak of it before? In Jeremiah chapter 4 when he said, hey, the people weren't obeying him. And he said, I tore this earth up at one time before. I destroyed this earth, that first earth age. If you don't think I'm not going to shake it again, you're mistaken. That's what this is talking about. But do you know something? As a servant of God, you don't have a thing in the world to worry about because he's not angry at you. you he finds you pleasing when you serve him, when you try. I know you're not going to be perfect, and I hope you never get that idea that you are become a goody-goody two-shoes play actor. But try. He considers that worthwhile. Verse 27. And this word... 
yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that's to say created, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. I don't know how easy do you shake and how easy are you shaken. If you're anchored in him, you can't be. I don't know how solid is your mind and faith that this word is true. Do you listen to fairy tales of other people aside from God's word and take man's word for something rather than God's word? Then you can be shaken. Because this word tells you exactly how it's going down. So that you know exactly where you should be and what you should be doing. Otherwise, friend, you're going to get shook off. And I guess um, those that can't be shaken, hey, it's going to remain. And do you know what that's talking about? Ultimately, when Satan and anything that can't align with God's plan goes into the lake of fire, and God is that consuming fire, it's blotted out so that we're rid of it. Thank God we're rid of it. We're rid of those that would bring trouble to the world and, and cause peace to flee from those that are peaceful people. Verse 28. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. That's why you got to get rid of weight friend. We're talking heavy here. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God at acceptably with reverence and godly fear that's why you want to get rid of, of those burdens that he has warned you to get rid of for God is not maybe is a consuming fire to you it's, he's the Holy Spirit his fire touches your heart your mind and your soul and you feel that warmth but to the devil it's a blowtorch you know, in the lake of fire. It, God spoke and nothing became everything. God speaks as the consuming fire and something becomes ashes. That's why it's written in Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 18 and 19 that Satan is turned to ashes from within. How do you think that happened? By God speaking. So it is. And that's what the lake of fire consists of. That's why it is called the second death. Doesn't have anything to do with the first. So, what a time to witness. What a time to live. Turn with me to Galatians. Right after the great Corinthians letters. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6. I want to talk about getting rid of burdens, okay? I want to help us know how to do it. I want to let us know how to shed weight that we have no business carrying if you're going to be doing God's business. You know, and people that do God's business have more fun than anyone else. They enjoy everything more than anyone else. So Galatians chapter 6, let's pick it up with verse 1. How do we shed burdens? Brethren, uh, incidentally, the word weight is used only one time in the New Testament translated burden. This is a little different Greek word meaning the same. Following through. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. I mean, you could be next. That's to say, you help someone that falls short. Why? They're out of the grace of God. So that's why a good Christian is going to reach out and help them. Help them back where they belong, if they're trying. If they're not trying, there won't be anything you can do about it anyway. You can't force a mind to change. God can, but you can't. 
But if a brother, <clears throat> excuse me, wants to join, rejoin the family, help them. Help them get rid of that weight. Or you could be next. Verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Love. That's love. So that's why, you know, we are a family. And you are yoked together doing his work. And don't you understand why it's so important that you get rid of your weight? Because it affects the whole family. It pulls down everyone. Why? Because you're not going to do your part. If God wants to, he's got so many spiritual messages and truths and feelings and what have you that he needs in a family. And if your mind is off in boom boom land, I'm sorry, you're going to miss your part. And that hurts the whole family. So therefore, if it is someone that wants to participate, just to be family now, okay? Just to be family then don't kick them while they're down. Don't slight them. You know, the enemy slights them enough and kicks them and nags at them. Don't you participate in Satan's work. You help them up. It is very difficult that we understand what is in the minds of other people. Occasionally a brilliant mind comes along and sometimes we have trouble catching up with that mind and what that person wants for themselves. But always remember, everyone must decide for themselves. That's it, friend, period. And let them stand or fall on that decision. But when they want help, help them. Verse 3. If a man think himself to be something, ooh wee, you ever know anybody like that? When he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. I, I don't suppose any of you have ever met a person like that. You know, uh, people that think they know it all um, really irritate someone that does. Okay. It's, kind of, it's really a bad, upsetting situation. Wouldn't it be something if somebody did know it all? We don't. God does. We're still working at it. Nobody knows it all. Verse 4. But let every man prove his own work. Don't butt in. He's doing something. Let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. He won't be comparing it to something else. That's what the Greek means. Five. For every man. There's that word every again. Right? Do you think it excluded you? Ah. Every man shall bear his own burden. That's just the way it is. But you got to get rid of the burden. Alright? If it's a weight that pulls you away from God's plan. Hey. God gave you a brain. Use it. And, and always remember this. I suppose that one of, the, one of our greatest weaknesses is we tend to think or uh, come to the conclusion in our families that the whole world orbits and circles around our mind. Okay? That we have to do the thinking for the whole family. Right. Well, I... I'm sorry, there's a stump about to appear before you. And if you got your shoes off, you're about to stump your toe. Because every individual must think for themselves. That doesn't mean, now please don't lose sight of the fact that we're supposed to help. But don't, don't be a budinsky. Is that a nice word? Did I say a bad word? I don't think so. As, you know, um, don't you just, don't you just, I don't want to use the word hate, but does anybody in here real comfortable with the budinsky, you know, that comes along? You know what you're doing and maybe you just don't want to take the time. It's personal and you don't want to take the time to explain it all to that person. But they got to know. You know, but why? Because they know everything. They want to advise you. 
look at their life and see what they've done. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's an interesting every man. And, and again, there's no gender in this. This includes you ladies. E everyone must... Um, as a matter of fact, I've got a, I've got a saying. Like some people, our church is so very successful that sometimes other groups feel, well, hey, you know, they've got it, they can share. No, I, I believe every keg should sit on its own bottom. You know, and, and I, I'm not, I don't mean that as being a smart aleck or something like that. But every keg should sit on its own bottom or God's not with it. Do you understand? And don't never send good money after bad. That, that just doesn't fly, okay? So kind of it's kind of that way with people. Every person, well, now that's not going to work, is it? I started to say every person must sit on their own bottom, but then uh, that's not going to fly, is it? Okay. They got to stand on their own two feet, all right? So I think I'm gonna, we're going to depart that right now and go to the great book of Matthew. Let's, let's, who puts these little old burdens in your path? I, again, I said God gave us a brain and he intends for us to use it. Who kind of has a way of burdening us with false information and will put usury out there and, hey, make it, please borrow one of our credit cards. I mean, it's only 2.9% interest for the first three months. Then it jumps to a staggering 18%. Hey, you can borrow money anywhere for less than 18%. Okay? So don't get taken in. Don't, don't be, you know, there's, there are people out there that plan and set traps. Chapter 23, did God, did Christ warn us of that? Well, let's see. Chapter 23, the great book of Matthew, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, verse 2, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of, in Moses' seat. Now, the Kenites, as we know way back to, to 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, became the bookkeepers for Judah, scribes. So we're talking about Kenites here, quite frankly, sons of Cain. Well, what does he mean they're sitting in this Moses' seat? Well, who was Moses? We read about him back in Hebrews chapter 11. He's the lawgiver. So you've allowed the enemy to now move into the law seat. That is to say, of your church, if you're not careful. All right? Because this has to do with religion. Pharisees and scribes, separated ones, and the bookkeepers. Verse 3. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe. I mean, they're pretty good Bible teachers. That observe and do, but do not ye after their works. For they say and do not. In other words, they're going to tell you to do certain things, but there's no way they're going to themselves. They are going to fleece the sheep. They're going to shear the flock. All right? So be, be ready. Verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens. Do you mean a church would do that? Oh, yes. They would bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born. And lay them on men's shoulders. You're supposed to get rid of them. And here they're laying them. They're packing them on there. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They're not going to try to help you. They're going against God's law. I have covered with you in this little short sermon how that you're supposed to get rid of them, not pack them up. He told you how that you help one another shed them and get rid of them. Now he's telling you who's piling them on. Now, what do they do then? Well, they pass laws on you and say you must do this and you must do that. And they make serving Christ such a burden that you can't even step out your door without sinning. And it's a bunch of malarkey. Okay? 
Christians enjoy life better than anyone else if you're a student of God's word and know what is and what is not. You got a lot of preachers in this world that will saddle you up to where you can't move. Always remember this. Always remember St. John chapter 8 verse, I think it's 32, that says, Learn the truth and the truth will set you free. Free. Don't ever listen to a man that teaches Christianity puts you in bondage or puts burdens upon you. It does just the opposite. It frees you from them. All right? Um, don't let them affect your life. Christ warns you. You've been warned from life. If your life is all tangled up, untangle it. Do it. Verse 5. But all their, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their philatteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Oh, brother, how do, doesn't this look holy? I mean, they're regular holy Joes, okay? Want to make themselves look good, looking good, looking holy. And love the uttermost, the uppermost uh, rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogue. That's to say the church. And greetings in the markets to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. That's, that's being translated, Master, Master. That Master, Master is kind of not the Christian way to do things. This is why I don't any, ever want any of you to call me Reverend. That's even why I can tell when I get a letter from someone in the television audience that says, Dear Reverend Murray, I know that's not one of our students. Because I don't think you should reverence any man. You should never reverence a man. Reverence rather God. Okay? There's just no man worthy of that. Now, I, I know I'm winning friends and influencing people, beloved. But I don't want you misled in somebody think, making you think by title and or appearance that they're more than they are. We're all children of God. We're all accountable. Verse 8, but be not ye called rabbi, don't even let anyone call you that, for one, master, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. We're all equal. All we that are in the flesh are equal. Don't let somebody play one-upmanship. Like, you'll get a bunch of these reverends, one of them will say, I talked to God this morning. God told me to be sure and park my car in spot number four. Well, let me tell you something. If you're not smart enough to know where to park your car, God's not going to talk to you. So he's lying. But he's making some other reverend think that he has a closer walk. They're playing, they're playing one-upmanship with you. Oh, my preacher talks to God every day. Now, we all do in prayer. All of us can. And if, hey, you don't need some other person to come to you and say, God has a message for you. God knows your address, okay? I get, you know, I have people that will come to this door right here and say, I have come from so and so and I have brought you a message from God, okay? And I said, well, that's strange. He's got my telephone number. And. I pray to him all the time, and usually if he wants to pull my chain, he does it himself. Why the change? Okay. That usually is very upsetting to a would-be uh, whatever. Okay, I, oh well, do I digress? I, I think so. Ten, neither be you called master, for one is your master, even Christ. Eleven, but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whatsoever, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. That means made ashamed. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. That's just the way it is. Don't try to be something you're not. Okay? And you know something? When God really blesses you, you've got to be careful. That, that will test your okra about as quick as anything. If God really blesses you, you can really begin to feel important. You are to him. 
But don't try to lord it over somebody else. All right? Be humble. Or I'll tell you what will happen to your blessings. God will cut them off. Now, back, back up with me to chapter 11 of this same book. In closing. Christ always has a way of helping you when he said, get rid of your burdens, all right? Here's some of the best advice he has given you concerning getting rid of your burdens. Chapter 11, the great book of Matthew, verse 25, in conclusion. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Like people that set their minds as little children, anxious to learn. Not, not having their minds blocked with a bunch of religionist theories or ideas. I would much rather teach someone that had never been in a church than to get some retread out of somewhere. They're already, you know, well, Reverend so-and-so says so-and-so. And they've never checked it out themselves in the Hebrew, the Greek, or the Aramaic. They think they know it because Reverend so-and-so said it. Isn't that something? Well, if you want to bet your eternal life on Reverend so-and-so, have at it. I would advise you to check it out for yourself because you're the one and not Reverend so-and-so that's going to stand before God when you either make heaven or hell. So you kind of need, if you think your soul is important, I'd check it out. Verse, like a little child, you take God's word and let God's word speak, not man, not this man or any other man. Verse 26, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. 27, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Has he revealed him to you? It's the word, I hope so, I think he has. 28, come unto me, that's a command. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You want to know how to get rid of those burdens? You want to know how to get rid of those bills that you've bitten off that you can't even comp played on how you're going to finish them up, ask him for help and use your brain. He promised, I will give you rest. That means I'm going to give you peace of mind from it. Now we've got some people in various churches, I couldn't believe it when I first started getting the information. Send all your bills to us and we'll burn them. Can you imagine that? I mean, that was television ministries. Send us your bills, pray over them, and we will burn them for you. But they usually wanted a couple of hundred bucks. Or I think when the year changed to 2,000, they want, some of them had the nerve to ask for 2,000 bucks. That's not going to pay your bills, friend, and a wise person knows that. Okay? But Christ promises that if you'll come to him, how, well, how do I do that? In his word. That's where you gain wisdom. And how to be successful in this world, both in the secular world and, um, and in the so-called religious world as far as that's concerned. That's how you do it. He, there's no problem that he hasn't covered. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you. That's a command. And learn of me. Did it say guess at me or ask Reverend Bob or Bill or to Hootie? No, I don't think so. He said, learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. That means right to the very center of your soul. That's a promise. What, what is a yoke? Check it out in the Greek, okay? First, it chains you to somebody else. It hooks you up. It's the same yoke that is on the balance beam that, of justice. That balances uh, things. But who are you yoked to? Not somebody aside from Christ, but you're actually yoked to.
to Christ when you're yoked to his word. That's why he can promise you rest. Why? If you yoke yourself to me, I may not be able to pull my part of the load. I guarantee you he can. When you yoke yourself to him and he promises rest, he's going to carry his part of the weight and he'll unload yours and see that you have peace. Do you know something? The physical part of this is this. Why? I, I don't know. I've had the pleasure or some might say displeasure. I enjoyed it of working various animals, both of livestock. And a yoke or a collar, if you happen to be working horses, keep trace chains from cutting into the flesh. Or the yoke on a, on a, a um, bovine keeps the trace from cutting again into the neck and they pull, have to pull evenly. Where if you tried to pull that same load without that yoke on, it would kill them. Well, you know, over time it would. It's bad enough to keep sores from collar sores when you first start working animals in the spring um, and their shoulders are tender for just the collar and it's padded well. But if you don't put Christ on, the trace chains are going to get you. You're going to pull yourself, you're going to pull the load, but it's going to cut into you. So you put that yoke on, he's on the other side. And when you fall, he'll pick you up. He'll carry his and yours too. So when you have those burdens, he's telling you here how to cast them off. Okay? You simply put on his yoke, learn of his word, and stay out of cesspools. That is to say, and stop making bad decisions. Stay out of usury. Verse 30, to complete the lecture. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Anything he puts on you, it is so light that it's a pleasure to do it. So, what do you do to be a witness? And I mean a witness standing with the caliber of people that we forementioned in faith. First, you've got to have faith, which is the deed to your inheritance. As, as the Greek stipulates in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And you put on his yoke, and you watch those burdens begin to shed like dirt from a plowshare as you plow into life as a successful person using wisdom to take advantage of those that would entrap you in usury or in many other schemes that are set forth and be successful. Do you know something? I can proudly, well I cannot proudly say. I started to say I can proudly say that this church has never gone in debt for anything. Nothing, nada, won't have it. Usury being, now young people many times for an automobile or a home or anything, there's nothing wrong with you borrowing money to make money, okay, if you know what you're doing. And many young people have to do that, but make sure you know what you're doing. Never be afraid to wade into the water, but I mean use your brain to where you know you're never going in over ankle deep, so that you're not going to drown. Well, how do I decide those? From God's Word, in part. Some of the best advice. Do you know where wisdom comes from? Proverbs, if you don't know your word, Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 tells you. All wisdom comes from God, and the beginning of wisdom in man is man's love for God. So serve him. Don't, don't carry around a bunch of dead weight. It's not good for you. Burdens, get rid of them. Take his yoke. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of serving you, Father, indeed. The joy, the pleasure. Thank you, Father, for this past year, which has been so bountiful, Father as we continue carrying thy word, the written word, to the world. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.